Hi. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for your patience. I know many of you got here well in advance, so thank you for sticking around. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Amy Ryan. I am the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council of Montana, and I'm thrilled to see this room packed full and excited to hear what our speaker has to say. Um, many of you have been to council events before, but a lot of you have not, so I'm just going to take a moment to introduce the council and, and what we do. Uh, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization located here in Missoula, Montana. Um, and we were founded by this guy behind me, Ambassador Mark Johnson, in 2000 and um, as a way to engage Montanans in the world around them and the issues that really affect us all and how Montana fits into the folds of, of global politics. So um, we are part of a larger organization called the World Affairs Council of Montana, which is uh, the largest nonprofit of its kind doing international education work in the nation. And uh, there are 90 chapters across the country and we're the Montana branch. So we've got big shoes to fill and we're, we're thrilled that we're doing the work we are and we have such a, an amazing territory to do it in. Um, so we, we do this work with a couple different programs. Um, one is our Distinguished Speakers Program, which you're a part of right now. And this looks like community discussions, which is what, what this is. Um, we also have business luncheons um, and high school visits. We bring them to local high schools, including Sentinel and Big Sky and, and Hellgate. Um, and then we set up some interviews and, and do some other networking with our speakers when we bring them in. Last um, April, we brought in the former ambassador from Afghanistan, Ambassador Saeed Jawad. So that's just an example of some of, and we bring in authors. We've brought in Hale S. Fondiari and, and some other um, folks such as that. So um, that's our, our biggest speaker program um, in terms of community engagement. And we also have global education initiatives. And um, this is really our way to reach students and teachers around the state. Our biggest global education initiative is called Academic World Quest, and that's held right here in this room without the dividers. We fill up the whole thing. Um, and it's a full day event uh, for high school students around the state. This last year we had um, over 250 students, the year before um, over 300. And it's um, a competition, sort of a global gauntlet competition on international affairs. Um, students, again, travel from all over the state in teams of four for the chance to represent represent Montana, excuse me, um, at the national competition in Washington, D.C. Um, and Montana is quite good. We compete against um, public schools and private schools and charter schools from across the nation, and we are a force to be reckoned with. So go Montana. Um, and so that's our biggest uh, global education initiative. Again, I mentioned it was a full day event. The competition is just one piece. Um, Ambassador Mark Johnson has a discussion with the high school students. Uh, we have a a foreign film discussion with a UM professor. Uh, we have a foreign student roundtable. We give them an issue and, the, and they get to dissect that. So there's a lot of different activities around the day and it's a really exciting event for these students. Um, and our newest global education initiative is called Council in the Classroom. And this was inspired um, by bringing our teachers, like I told you, into our local high schools. And as our name states, we're the World Affairs Council of Montana, and we really, we really want to do that. We want to reach all of Montana. And so we thought, how can we bring our speakers on our limited resources out to the corners of this massive fourth largest state? So um, we've teamed up with a local company called Alter Enterprise, um, an inspired classroom, and we do video conferencing um, with these classrooms around the state. So they can see our speaker, who's in a studio in East Missoula, and he can see them, and they can see each other we have about five classrooms at a time engaging and it's a really amazing experience mark did it our board president bob seiden schwartz we had ambassador saeed jawad from afghanistan do it and also a professor um, from the university udo fluke also has participated we do nine a year and it's this amazing way for them to engage they get to ask you know what's your favorite food to the afghan ambassador and then also what's it like with life after the taliban and you know they sort of sit like this to begin with, and then by the end, they're like hanging on to the edge of their chairs. So it's a really amazing way to engage them in these 
in these issues and with people, you know, putting a face to these, to these issues in these countries um, like nothing else before that we've seen. So we're really excited about that. Um, and then our final education initiative is our Turkey workshops. Um, we have, we send teachers to Turkey and we have um, programs, some for teachers, so if you are a teacher, uh, let us know. And uh, we have workshops and we have you guys put on workshops in your communities and that's from a grant from the Turkish Cultural Foundation. So that's um, our other way that we get out into the classrooms. Um, that's just a little bit about it. There's more if you want to pack it about what we do um, or come and talk to one of us and we'll, we'll give you more in depth, but we want to get to the fun stuff. So um, one more thing, I do want to tell you about our upcoming program, which is on September 9th, and we're doing something new we've never done before. It's um, our first annual Montana Global Educator of the Year Award. So we're wanting to recognize and honor a teacher who goes above and beyond um, their responsibilities to bring their classrooms and communities, international education resources and opportunities. And um, we just met yesterday, a committee with our board members met to pick um, out of the nominations. We had nominations coming in throughout the summer for the last about a month or so. And our committee just met yesterday, so we're really excited to announce uh, who the Montana Global Educator of excuse me, the year will be. I can't tell you today, you've got to come to the event on September 9th, hold you in suspense. Um, and that's going to be at 7 o'clock at the Governor's Ballroom in the Florence Building. And this event is going to be coupled with a Distinguished Speaker Program. And that's going to be with Brandon Bastide, who's the Executive Director of Gallup Education. And Gallup Education just did this global um, survey on from countries all over the world, I think over 150 countries, um, on, on their educational systems, on what works, what doesn't work, um, how it affects their economy, how it affects their worker, um, their unemployment rates, all these amazing things. And he's going to come and talk about that and talk about educating the next generation of global citizens. So it's going to be a really fascinating talk. I heard him speak in DC. He's absolutely phenomenal. And I would really encourage you to come um, support the Global Educator of the Year and, and hear uh, Mr. Bastide um, talk a little bit about education. Again, that's September 9th at 7 o'clock, and there's going to be a, a fun dessert reception afterwards that you guys can get to know him. So um, with all that, um, we do all of this on a limited budget, and um, we don't get any money from the university. They do sponsor us sometimes, but we're not university funded, and we're not um, federally funded or state funded. We get all our member, um, all our, uh, sorry, income from memberships and donations and sponsorships. So I would love to invite all of you to become a member if you're not already. If you are, thank you. Um, one of the perks, as of many, are a free admission to events like these and um, often reduced admission to other larger events that we have, as well as some other um, benefits that we can tell you about later. So I would invite you to become a member, and, and you can do so online, um, montanaworldaffairs.org, or you can get a, a flyer out there. So um, all of your support really does make a difference and makes all these programs I've told you about come to life. Um, and the last thing that makes all of these programs come to life is our amazing staff. Um, Aubrey Lyons, who many of you know uh, was the previous executive director. I know many of you know her personally. Uh, she's back with the council now helping us out and consulting for us. So we're thrilled to have her back and it's, uh, we really double the manpower, sky's the limit now. And we also have our fabulous interns who, um, university interns mostly, at least they went here at one point, and um, they are our bread and butter. We couldn't do it without them. They um, are our very foundation. Everything you see in front of you is in some way touched by the interns. So I do want to thank them as well. So now the fun part, the, the part you've been waiting for, I get to introduce Ambassador Mark Johnson. Uh, many you, of you know him or have heard him speak before, but I just want to say a little bit about him in case you don't. Um, he is a fourth generation Montanan, originally from Great Falls, uh, who served for 30 years in a variety of different foreign um, policy positions. He was a United States ambassador to to Senegal from 93 to 96. He was deputy chief of mission um, and reopened the embassy during the Desert Storm uh, military campaign in Kuwait. Uh, he was the deputy chief of mission at the American embassy in Cairo and was engaged in the Middle East uh, peace process. He was in the office of Iranian affairs and worked on the Iran hostage working group. 
And the list goes on and on. And if you have a blue pamphlet, I encourage you to read it. Um, but at the time of his retirement, he was a deputy inspector general of the State Department. And as I told you before, he's also the founder of the council and a fantastic resources on uh, what we're about to hear. So without further ado, I appreciate your, your listening and uh, help me welcome Ambassador Mark Johnson. Well, great. Thank you, Amy. That was a very lovely introduction. I, I hope you can all hear me fine. It's working pretty good. Good. Thank you. Uh, I have given speeches where the power went out, learned that those are the best speeches I ever gave. <laughs> so you have no excuse, so here we go. Uh, it's wonderful to see all of you here. It really is. It's uh, uh, very gratifying. And when I started the council, now going on the 14th year, it was my hope that we would create a forum like this uh, where we could get together and, and have these kinds of discussions. And one thing I've observed over the years, we've now done over 200 programs, is that we can have the kinds of discussions here in Missoula when the microphones don't follow it up. I think it's just feedback from this mic. Is it? OK. We can have the kinds of conversations that they seem to be unable or unwilling to have in, uh, in Washington, D.C., for example. We've had the Iranian ambassador here. Tough issues, a difficult relationship, in fact, no relationship. We had a very fine discussion. Thanks. Uh, we've had the Syrian ambassador here, and I'm going to talk about Syria. Syria is very, very much in the news today. So again, thank you very much. This is the opening of our 2013-2014 of our season. One of the things I wanted to amplify that Amy said about our academic world quest, we're very proud of that. I started with three schools, now we're up to 50 from across the state. Really amazing to see the young students and their teachers come out. For three years in a row, Montana has, or Missoula rather, has had the third largest program in the United States. Behind a couple of towns. So the batting order is Dallas, Honolulu, Missoula, all right? And that's a tribute to our students, their teachers, and their parents, and we're very, very proud of that. Uh, my topic tonight is an easy, lighthearted, whimsical one, a current state of affairs in the Middle East. And when we set this program up, I wanted to do it uh, before I began some international travel. It didn't quite look as, uh, as challenging as it's going to be tonight. We'll talk about current events in Egypt. We'll talk about events in Iran and in Syria, which, as I said, is very much in the news today. I want to share something with you. I have spent 40 years looking at this region as a diplomat in Iran and Egypt, the Persian Gulf, Kuwait. I've lived in the region. I've studied about it. I've taught about it here in U at UM. I was very fortunate to do that for a number of years. Sally, my wife, and I go back several times. We were in Cairo, for example, in April. I have never seen the region so volatile or so troubled as it is today. And I think that is a good enough reason to have this kind of uh, conversation. Now, first, I like to just do a little geography. There we go. And we'll focus on Egypt on your left. We'll focus on Syria, which is in the middle. Let's see if this little laser will pick it up. I don't know that I can even, I can't see it. And then Iran, which is on the far right. The countries of the, uh, of the Arab League, 22 members of the Arab League, just to set it in your mind, that's roughly the same land mass as the United States, and it's roughly the same population as the United States, just to give you an idea. Uh, it features excessive wealth, Dubai, places like that, but also a lot of poverty and hardship throughout the region. Two other countries have to be added to this list. One is, of course, Israel. Israel lives in a state of strategic distress. Uh, they have a very difficult neighbor. Wouldn't you have a tough neighbor with you at Iraq and Iran on one side, Syria to your north, and a very, very uncertain relationship with Egypt? And then we add the nation of Iran. Iran has an entirely different cultural, historical, linguistic background. And one way to offend an Iranian is to call he or she 
uh, an Arab. So that is, that's the Middle East. Now, whenever I do talk about the region, there are two points that I always stress. First of all, it's the region that you're looking at today that will determine the success or failure of the president's foreign policy. That's a strong statement. It's not a political statement. If you have any doubts, consult Mr. Jimmy Carter or George W. Bush. It will play that role. The second point, however, is even more important. And quite honestly, it's, it's the only thing I insist that you take away from this talk. You can forget about the rest. The Middle East is many things. If we go around, we'll say sand, we'll say oil, we'll say camels, palm trees, terrace, you name it. But above all, the Middle East is people. There are real people there. And the people are wonderful. And Sally and I have just been overwhelmed by the generosity and hospitality. Here are two young girls in Egypt, schoolgirls at the medieval citadel from the 12th century, uh, very lovely young ladies, very proud to be Egyptian. This was slightly, just slightly before the first revolution in 2011. Iranian young women. Here is a group of, uh, sorry, that was Egyptian, this is Iranian in Tabriz in northwest Iran. You see my wife in the center. The warmth that you see on those faces is real and genuine. Don't demonize these people. You may <clears throat> demonize their reptilian, brutal, repressive government, the Islamic Republic of Iran. But these people are wonderful. They want nothing more than what we have and what we take for granted. So let's keep that in mind. To put it mildly, the Middle East is uh, a little bewildering these days, and I've constructed a kind of framework to help us set our minds to it. It flows from the work of the distinguished Harvard professor Samuel Huntington. Some of you are, are familiar with his classic work, The Clash of Civilizations, right? I have a different clash. In fact, I have two clashes, and I'll bring these uh, to your attention. The first is a clash of a, a civilization. Who speaks for Islam? These young women or the brutal terrorists that murdered Chris Stevens in Benghazi? Which one of those represents the real face of Islam? That's the clash of a civilization. The other clash to us is more obscure, but it's very real. That clash is between, among civilizations, and I'll simplify it for now, but we'll come back and discuss it in more detail. That is the clash between the Persians and the Arabs the Shia is Muslims and the Sunni Muslims, the two main strains of Islam. And whereas the first clash is on display in Egypt, this clash is very starkly on display in today's Syria. And we'll have a chance to look at both of these as, as the top goes on. Now, um, because, <laughs> let us say, this is kind of a fluid situation that we're dealing with in the region, I hope you'll understand that there may be some gaps in my presentation. I'm going to try and bring things up to date, and in so doing, I may slip over, gloss over, ignore certain parts of the history. That's not deliberate. Well, maybe it is because I don't know it, but, but you can come back to it in the question and answer. But I want to get some broader points out. We'll begin first with one of my favorite countries, Egypt. If you look north to south, you see the Nile. Uh, to your right, you'll see the Sinai. The Sinai is a source now of very, very deadly terrorism. It is a big challenge for Egypt to bring that under control. And therefore, if it is a big challenge for Egypt, it is an even bigger challenge for Israel because Israel's on the other side of that border. Uh, Egypt is about the size, let us say, New Mexico and Texas uh, combined. It is at the epicenter of the Middle East. It is the heart and soul of the Middle East. Every fourth Arab is an Egyptian. Egypt has the largest army in the Middle East. It's the center of religious scholarship, one of the oldest universities in the world. It's the center of art and culture. The last Nobel laureate for literature was an Egyptian, the great Naguib Mahfouz. It is the linchpin for US interests, which is why the US has taken kind of a on again, off again, and, and sort of quiet approach to some of the recent activities uh, that, that have happened here. I'm, I'm going to do just a bit of history. You know, Egypt has five and a half millennia of history, and I'm not going to get into that. I can just go back a couple of years, maybe. It's like an eye blink in Egypt time. We'll go back about eight years, 
And I'm going to give you a couple of dates, and I'll use those to illustrate and punctuate who the chief players are. The first date is 2005. I actually was in Cairo at the time as part of a delegation, and, and I was sitting next uh, to the prime minister of Egypt when the news came down that the Mubarak regime had decided to open up the presidential election to other candidates. And this was quite uh, an electrifying news, and for, for several weeks and months afterwards, that was the talk of the town. Subsequently, the elections of 2005 went badly. Uh, the regime panicked, they cracked down, it became the same old, same old. But out of this, the seeds were planted for political parties emerging and that would play, that would play a role in events like this. This picture is June 30th, this year, Cairo. You're watching part of the, of the largest political demonstration in Cairo, and some people have suggested in humankind. Somewhere between 10 to 20 million people participated in these demonstrations, and this gives you a glimpse of the people power that was on display. The parties that came out of this had names like April 6th, Kafeya, <coughs> Tamarad, and so forth. Now, to be brutally honest, the parties uh, are weak, and they seem to feature only the vanities of the leaders that have formed the parties. This, the parties collectively failed to rise to the occasion in 2011, when Hosni Mubarak was overthrown, which is why the Brotherhood came in. They have failed again in 2013, which is why the military is now getting, is establishing a firm control. They will be on the sidelines. The second date that I would bring to your attention is 2007, which is a date virtually unknown to all of us. The Muslim Brotherhood issued a manifesto. The Brotherhood was in the process of changing its leadership, the so-called Supreme Guide. And they put forth a manifesto, which they've denied, but which I've seen. It had a chilling effect. It said, for example, the Brotherhood would impose a Supreme Religious Council that would vet, approve, and pass on all legislation passed by the, by the secular civilian parliament, the Egyptian majlis in effect. They also said that no Christian could run for office. Now hold that thought when we look at what's happening today with the Coptic church in Egypt. And they said no, wo no, woman, no women could run for the presidency. The Brotherhood, Brotherhood emerges in, in 1928, founded by a man named Hassan Obana, B-A-N-N-A, who was a pious Muslim school teacher horrified that Islam had been corrupted by colonial in influences and, uh, and less than religiously observant, shall we say, Muslims in Egypt. The Brotherhood started as a social welfare, orga social welfare organization. It became a political wing for a couple of decades into the 60s. It had an armed resistance uh, wing. The Brotherhood renounced uh, violence after that, but yet we see now that that may be back in favor with the, the, the Brotherhood. It is the largest Islamic gathering organization in the Arab world. It has a long pedigree. It's sp spun off a lot of, of sister brotherhoods. Hamas, for example, is the Muslim Brotherhood in Palestine. There's a Muslim Brotherhood in Syria. There's one in Jordan and, and so forth. The Brotherhood is now on its heels. It has been dealt a serious blow in the aftermath of the July ouster of the Brotherhood president, Mohammed Morsi. More on that in a minute. And finally, what I think is the most significant event that colors, even dominates political events in Egypt today, occurred in 2010, another date that's obscure to us. Rumors began to surface in Cairo that the president, Hosni Mubarak, the pharaoh, was going to designate his son, Gamal, as the next president. This infuriated, in fact, it, uh, it stunned the, brother, the, the, the military. Number one, Gamal was not a military officer. Sadat had been a military officer. Gamal Abdel Nasser had been a military officer. Uh, Hosni Mubarak had been the commander of the Air Force. Who is this guy, Gamal? He's a civilian. He can't run, he can't run Egypt. But the real reason was that Gamal and his young, younger group of economic reformers who had made great strides in streamlining and modernizing the economy, achieving growth rates of 5 to 7%, which really uh, seem unbelievable today when we look at the economy uh, collapsing. This reform effort began to eat into, to cut into, and erode the privileged and pampered position of the Egyptian military. The Egyptian military not only fights wars, 
They also have a big slice of the economy, somewhere between 20 to 40 percent. So the Brotherhood was agitating to put Gamel aside, and in the process, they actually engineered the overthrow of Hosni Mubarak. So on February 11, 2011, I think we had a discussion a few days after that. The people of Egypt discovered their power. Hosni Mubarak discovered his, his weakness, and he was ousted. The, bro the military did not want to do the heavy lifting of governing, but they were looking for a partner that could run the government day to day. The landscape was pretty thin, so they looked to the Muslim Brotherhood. They were the best organized. Uh, they had the most grassroots support. So they said, they reasoned, we'll turn it over to the Brotherhood and they can take care of it. This was a, 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 an unholy alliance because these two groups have been fighting each other over the decades. And what happened through 2011 and 2012 was the tyranny of weakness, I call it, the tyranny of weakness. Not one person seemed to have a coherent plan. Not one person could do something about the economy. Foreign exchange dropped. Foreign capital fled. Uh, tourism dropped uh, uh, rapidly, and, and Egypt was really suffering and, and reeling. In the meantime, the Brotherhood was working behind the scenes to implant an Islamic government. They uh, achieved an outcome in the parliament where they had a majority. They uh, put through a constitution that was much, much more Islamic than anything Egypt had, had witnessed in recent in decades. And they began to plan for the, for the elections. And to be sure, on uh, a, a year ago, J June of 2012, Mo uh, Mohammed Morsi was elected the president of Egypt. This was a very major event. It was the first time in 5,000 years that Egypt had had a free and open election. Morsi won by a couple of, of points. And then things fell off the edge which brings us to where we are today. As we go through 2011 and into 2012, uh, a, buy, a sense of buyer's remorse sets in among the people, not only just secular liberals, but also among uh, Muslims, that, that Morsi uh, was both trying to ram Islam, their brotherhood's version of Islam, down people's throats, and that they were totally incompetent. Stunningly stupid was how I described it. <laughs> Stunningly stupid. Uh, one day, Morsi imposed a 300% tax on alcohol. Uh, the next day, he, he rescinded it. He really didn't know what he was doing. Uh, and what really brought this to a head was in November of 2012, when Morsi assigned to himself dictatorial powers. He was above any judicial review. He was above any legislative review. And the military now became agitated. And I said, oh my God, what have we done? Protests started to spring up in the spring of 2013. A large campaign to recall Morsi surfaced. And it is said that 20 million signatures were acquired. And on June 30th, we had this picture, the results that you saw in this first picture. Millions and millions of Egyptians of all, all political persuasions began to agitate against, against Morsi. The military stepped in, much like they did in, had, much as they had in, in 2011. Uh, General uh, Abdul Watan al Sisi, S I S I, uh, was the lead general. He said to the Muslim Brotherhood, You have 48 hours to shape up or ship out. Obviously, the Brotherhood rejected this. Morsi was deposed. Guess what? Same old, same old. The military is now back in control. The Brotherhood, the Brotherhood did not go quietly in, in the, into the night. They resisted. They formed these two large camps in downtown Cairo. And on April 14th, all hell broke loose. The military went into these camps, allegedly to clean the camps of the protesters. What, in fact, the military wanted to do was to crush the Brotherhood. Now was their chance. And we saw the reports of the violence. Somewhere between 700 to 1,000 people were killed. Uh, Human Rights Watch puts most of the blame on the military, but does not absolve the Brotherhood for the violence. After all, they had been stockpiling arms. That brings us to a point where we are right now. The military is steadily increasing power. It is attempting to decapitate the Brotherhood. And one thing you need to know about Egypt that's very important. The military is 
probably the most respected, in some cases even revered, institution in, in Egypt. And the reason for that is every Egyptian has in his DNA a craving for stability. You know, they've lived by the Nile, the Nile rises, the Nile drops, and it's this, this urgent urge for stability that informs their world view. Egyptians say, well, yeah, we don't mind progress, but we just don't like change. <laughs> and they say, you know, you, you Americans are exactly the opposite. You like a lot of change, but you never get any progress, right? <laughs> maybe, they, maybe they have a point there. Uh, and that's why I think the military, according to latest opinion polls, enjoys about 65% of, 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 of support. In other words, a majority of Egyptians approves, approve of what the military is doing with regard to the Brotherhood. How will this play out? I think democracy is taken, not going to take a hiatus for several years. Uh, you, you know, and the, the, the Obama administration has been trying to play this very carefully. After the coup that ousted, the coup that dare not speak its name, uh, the administration, in fact, uh, one of the funniest things I think I've ever heard, uh, an unnamed spokesman from the White House issued the following statement. We cannot say it was a coup. We cannot say it was not a coup. We just cannot say. <laughs> And I said to myself, I had no idea Emily Littell at Saturday Night Live was working in the White House press office. You know, never mind, that kind of thing. And there are reasons they took that position, although I think they should have spoken out more forcefully when some of the violence erupted, committed by both sides. But, but, but there we are. The Brotherhood, uh, the Brotherhood has the tougher challenge. They, uh, uh, the Brotherhood waited 80 years to get back, to get into power as an opposition group. 80 years, very patient people. They lost it in eight months. They're not going to come back. Not going to come back. They should because they represent a, dominant, a, a large segment of the body politic. But I don't see that happening uh, for a long period of time. The military will either revert to one of two models. The model of Gamal Abdel Nasser in the 50s, uh, which uh, featured really kind of brutal uh, repression, or the more light-handed repression, repression is repression, right, of Hosni Mubarak uh, that put the Brotherhood, uh, kept the Brotherhood in place. It's not a good outcome, uh, but as I say, we're not Egyptians. We don't have to, we don't live with that, and the majority of them uh, do support this. I suspect as time goes on, the military will be, will be a target, but the problem is, aside from the military and the Brotherhood, there's no, there is no Nelson Mandela in Egypt, sadly. I wish that were not the case. I wish they had a, pop, a, a politician that could rise to the occasion. The only one that we're familiar with is, uh, is Mohammed El Baradai, the former head of the International Atomic Energy Agency. And he got fed up and fled back to Vienna. And he's, he's, he's out of the picture. Now, if that's not bad enough, there's one other crisis. And I'll just be, I'll touch on it very briefly. The Nile. Egypt is facing some very serious problems with the allocation of the Nile waters. Egypt and Sudan control about 80% of the water under the terms of a 1959 agreement. The upriver up African countries are very anxious to change that. They're complaining bitterly that they've been shortchanged. If you can see it here, in about the middle of the screen, is Ethiopia's Grand Millennium Dam. It is said to divert about 20% of the Nile water during the construction phase. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Whether it's 1%. The effect of that on Egypt will be catastrophic. That's all there is. They don't get any rain. And I suspect, I cannot prove this, one of the reasons why the military stepped in is they were worried that Morsi and the Brotherhood were not able, would not be able to defend Egypt's sovereign water rights. This will bubble along, it will be in the news. We'll come back the next time maybe we talk about Egypt and see what's happened. So now it's time to turn to something lighthearted and straightforward, Iran. Now, there's an easy country. There's a joke in Washington, and like most jokes in Washington, actually most people think Washington is the joke, but this joke isn't particularly funny, but it goes as follows. What are the top three foreign policy challenges uh, for the Obama administration? And the answer is Iran, Iran, and Iran, and roughly in that order. And I would say that is still true up to a point, although Syria seems to be making a, a case uh, for crowding some of that out. 
I'm going to begin the discussion on Iran in a very peculiar, bizarre way. Bear with me. I'm going to start in Lagos, Nigeria. October of 2010, a customs inspector in the Lagos port discovers there are 13 cargo containers. They're marked construction materials. He is curious. He opens the, the, the containers, and he finds they're just packed with ammunition from Iran. Rifles, grenades, rockets, some explosives, what have you. And they're destined for minor small-scale insurgencies along the coast, west coast of Africa, uh, from, from Senegal and the Casamance to the Gambia down to Guinea. Uh, these are very obscure, microscopic places in the scheme of things, and yet here's Iran furnishing arms to these rebels. 20,000 in 2012, the uh, wife of the Israeli defense attaché narrowly misses being killed when a car, a bomb attached to her car fails to go off. Bangkok, Bangkok Thailand, four Iranian terrorists are, uh, are apprehended with massive amounts of explosives attempting a terrorist attack. A busload of Israeli tourists in Bulgaria are attacked by Hezbollah, a proxy for, for the Iranians. Kenya has just arre arrested two Iranians and has sentenced them on charges of, of, of uh, attempting to commit uh, terrorism. Tbilisi, Georgia, we've seen, seen the same thing. And a case that I know because it affected us personally uh, in the U.S. in October of 2011, federal authorities arrested an Iranian-American named uh, Arbab Siar who was plotting to assassinate the Saudi ambassador in Washington, D.C. Uh, evidence was gained by the uh, NSA. Uh, he had been calling. Apparently, the NSA was, was not recording their ex-girlfriend's conversations at that time, and so they could do some security work. Who knows? Uh, uh, and they found that he had this, this, hapless, uh, this hapless fellow in Houston uh, was really uh, uh, the cousin of a very senior Iranian Revolutionary Guard person. And because of that, three days before we were to make our third trip to Iran, uh, we decided that, Sally and I decided it would be very prudent for us not to go to Iran, lest the regime would be looking for some way to retaliate. Our Bob Siar has been sentenced to 35 years. So why am I telling you this? What difference does it make? Two, two reasons. One, it illustrates the point that Iran today is the leading state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, my God, I haven't even mentioned the Middle East yet, and here they're messing around in Africa, in French Guiana, in Argentina, leading sponsor of state terrorism. The Iranians, I believe, see an opportunity to expand their influence in various ob very obscure places of the world. And we'll get to Syria, which is really at the heart of this effort. Syria is the strategic objective for the, for the Iranian uh, regime. Um, a couple of points I make about Iran. First, I already said this, Iran is not Arab. As the great uh, epic poet Ferdowsi once said, damn on this place, damn on this time, that these uncivilized Arab lizard eaters have come to force us to accept uh, Islam. I think you get the sense of how the Persians feel uh, about the Arabs. The Iranians see themselves as heirs to one of the world's greatest civilizations, the Persian Empire. This informs the viewpoint of virtually every Iranian that we met. We're special. We deserve respect. You'll hear this word respect when we get to the nuclear negotiations. We are a country. We are a proud country worthy of the respect of other great uh, countries. And finally, Iran is the world's main Shia country. And because the Shia are the underdog numerically compared to the Sunnis, uh, it has caused the Iranians over, over the centuries uh, to see themselves as the oppressed, the victim, the underdog. And that has also informed the way they act. Now, usually I will, I will delve right into the nuclear issue, and I'll do that in just a moment. But I have been guilty of overlooking something I think is very important. I'll touch on it very briefly, and that is Iran's dreadful human rights record. Uh, if you read Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, UN, UN Commission on Human Rights, or even the State Department's uh, Human Rights Annual Human Rights Report, they'll say that essentially the same thing, that Iran has a deplorable record. Civil liberties uh, are ignored. An example of this occurred after the fraudulent 2009 presidential election. Uh, the two leading candidates 
are accused of fomenting sedition and revolution. And they've been put under house arrest in a closet-sized space uh, now for two and a half years. So this, uh, Iran has a very serious, uh, awful human rights record. The other point that I'll mention is the state of the economy, the Iranian economy, both because of the sanctions, also because of gross mismanagement. The national currency, the real, has lost about 70% of its value. Oil exports have plummeted uh, to less than a million barrels a day. Back in the day, there were almost three to four million barrels a day. That's a lot of revenue uh, that the Iranians have lost. So the big issue, the big uh, area of contention between us and Iran, and the West for that matter, is the nuclear issue. And it falls into three parts. And I'll go through it briefly to help you understand a little bit of how the negotiations have unfolded. The first part is the civilian energy the civilian nuclear reactor at Bushir. This is a very legitimate activity. I was involved with it in the 70s. I think it makes a lot of sense. The Iranians reason, as the Shah reasoned, that it would be better to free up hydrocarbon resources, which can earn a lot of money, and use the nuclear power uh, to, to, uh, uh, to heat and light homes. And that's what they're doing. That uranium, the uranium used in that facility is about 3%. All right. The second aspect of the nuclear program is a medical research reactor, the TRR, the Tehran Research Reactor, which actually the Eisenhower administration furnished to the Iranians back in the days of the Shah. That enrichment, that uranium is enriched to 20%. Okay. And the third aspect, the one that is the most sensitive and controversial, is the nuclear fissile, the bomb, and there the uranium is enriched to 90%. The reason I'm telling you this is that in reprocessing, it's much harder and more time consuming to go from 3 to 20 than it is to go from 20 to 90. And that's why people are concerned if the Iranians acquire a sufficient stock of 20% material, they can make a, a dash to 90% and have enough for one, two, three, or possibly four bombs. And there are estimates this could occur as early as the end of this year or midpoint of 2014. Iran has passed, Iran is now well past all of the technological barriers that might inhibit it to develop a, a device. In other words, they have mastered the technologies. I, I look at Iran and its nuclear program as I would look at a magician. Now, I mean, we may have a few magician, professional amateur in the crowd, but you know how the operation goes. The magician wants you to watch that hand, correct? As you watch this hand and he does something dazzling, it's this hand that's doing the magic trick, right? And if they're good, they can pull it off and you don't detect a thing. This hand says, would you please watch 3.5%, 19.75% enrichment or whatever it is. And so the West is fixated on we, the number of centrifuges, the level of enrichment, this hand is developing things like neutron initiators or blast caps. It is developing explosive bridge wires which channel the explosion and simplistically, I guess, give it more bang for its buck. This hand is developing multipolar blast chambers where they carry out simulations of, of what a, a nuclear blast would look like. The latter activity w took place at a military base called Parchin in southwest uh, uh, Iran, or, or south of Tehran, Parchin. The uh, International Atomic Energy Agency has tried for years to visit that plant, and the Iranians have refused them. Well, guess what? The Iranians have bulldozed that plant and have paved it over. They've done the science, they've done the research, and they're ready, they're ready to move on. So I think to assume that the Iranians are not moving in this direction, notwithstanding the, the, the statements that we hear from certain Iranian officials. Notwithstanding that, I think that would be willful ignorance. I think they are moving in that direction, uh, as I've looked at it. That does not mean that once they possess it, they would use it, but they certainly would have a credible threat. And if you look at all the things that are, are unfolding, let's take, for example, Syria, which we'll get to. Imagine, Syria's bad enough, right? Imagine if the world thought, Iran had a nuclear weapon. Might that not factor be factored into your calculation of how to deal with that? I think it certainly would. I think no president could ignore that. Now, there is some good news, maybe. Let's hope so. Iran's had a presidential election. Hassan Rouhani is the new president. He is a senior cleric. He's a religious person. 
Uh, the West seems to be infatuated with him. They have given him the label of moderate. It has been my experience in dealing with Iran that moderate senior officials, clerical in, in the Islamic Republic of Iran, moderate people like that, are as difficult, it's, it's hard to imagine. It would be easier to imagine a full service nightclub in Saudi Arabia, frankly. <laughs> But he, but, but he has some, some, he supports the nuclear program, he supports the Syrian. He is part of the regime, so we should not get our, let ourselves be carried away and become overly giddy about his, his, his election. He has said the right things about wanting to resume the negotiations. That's very important, absolutely. He has said publicly, said it again yesterday, I favor talks on our nuclear issue, and I hope to be able to resume them as soon as possible. That's not nothing. That's significant. It puts you way ahead of where we were with, this former, uh, with the former president, Ahmadinejad. Moreover, the new foreign minister of Iran is a man named Mohammad Javid Zarif, Z-A-R-I-F. I give you that name because you may see him from time to time on, on American television. Uh, he studied in the United States. He lived in the United States. Uh, he went to San Francisco, and he got a doctorate from Denver University. And I talked to one of his professors at DU who said he's simply brilliant. And I met him in New York at the uh, home of the Iranian representative in uh, Manhattan. And he is a very, very intelligent, skillful man. He will be a very, very tough adversary, very articulate. He knows the nuclear issue. He is now in charge of it, which I think is a good thing. But I can only say I hope our delegation has their game on because he will be a fierce, uh, a fierce uh, uh, opponent. One last point about the nuclear issue. The contours of a negotiation are pretty clear, and the elements of a deal are also present. It doesn't take too much imagination. The Iranians want relief from sanctions, clearly. The United States wants either curtailment, modification, uh, suspension of the enrichment program, all right? Those are the two parameters. My fear is that, and I'm, if I know it, I'm sure the Iranians know it, the sanctions that the U.S. has levied against Iran are embedded in nine pieces of U.S. legislation, laws, and in 16 presidential executive orders. Some of the executive orders, some of the contents of the executive orders have been transferred into the legislation. In order to relieve, relax, remove those sanctions, you have to do it legislatively. Do you really think? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and here's, here's an example. Last week, maybe the week before, the US House of Representatives uh, uh, passed legislation calling for tougher sanctions, and it passed by a vote of 400 to 20. On the US Senate side, a group of senators, numbering 76, sent a letter to President Obama saying the same thing. And furthermore, I would point out that the two leading voices, one in the House and one in the Senate, the two leading voices are both Democrats. This will be very tough. Can you imagine we get to a situation where we're unable, because of the legislative branch, to move ahead toward an agreement? Now, I may be wildly imagining things, all right? I usually, sometimes I do. But I think it's a point worth noting as we get to uh, any kind of a, a progress toward a negotiated settlement. Now, I said there were two clashes, and now we'll get to the second one, the clash among civilizations. I know this is a busy map, so I'll explain as best I can in just a second. When the Prophet Muhammad died in the seventh century, <clears throat> there, a controversy erupted in the Islamic world as it was then. Uh, who would succeed the Prophet, right? I'm grossly oversimplifying, but, but I hope it works. One group said it has to be a member, it should be a member, a righteous member of the community. They became known as the Sunnis. The other group said, no, 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 it has to be a family member, even a blood relative of the Prophet, and they became the Shia, centered around Ali, who is the fourth uh, caliph, the party of Ali, or the Shiites. All right? Historically, that has uh, turned into the conflict between the Persians, and the Arabs, and in modern political terms, it's the Iranians versus the Saudis. This is a big deal. This is a big, big clash. I remember, remember Saddam Hussein? <laughs> Saddam Hussein was hanged uh, around Christmas Eve in 2006. You can see it. You can go to YouTube and watch it if you're 
I don't recommend it, but you could. Uh, and as he was led up to the gallows, Saddam became his usual defiant cell, blustering in a way. And in the crowd, he was taunted by people who were clearly Shia. Saddam was a Sunni. And as he awaited the trap door to open, he said the following things. I, I find them fascinating. He said, death to outsiders. OK. Death to Americans, I would expect. And his last words were, death to Persians. Now, was Saddam referring to the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s? Possibly. They have long memories in that part of the world. Was he referring to the fact that when the Mongols invaded Iraq and sacked Baghdad, which was the center of Islamic scholarship and civilization, the door to the fortress, the gate, was opened by a man named Aldomi, who is said to be a Persian, a Shia. And so this has deep and long roots in, in the Middle East. It is on display, as I said, in, in, in Syria, where you have a form of a Shia regime, the uh, al-Assad family, fighting uh, against organizations sponsored by the Sunnis. The dispute, the clash, the turbulence in, in Syria erupted in much the same way as it did in countries like Tunisia and e Egypt throughout the, the uh, Arab Spring. It quickly turned into an uh, armed conflict. A civil war emerged, uh, groups fighting. And they formed something called the Free Syrian Army. They formed a national coalition of various parties. They began to have some success militarily. And the regime was knocked back on its heels. And then it changed from a civil war to a proxy war. And the following things happened. The Russians were there. The Russians have a naval base uh, in Latakia, uh, which is just above the word uh, Lebanon on, on this map of Syria. Actually, it's in northern Syria. The Russians went in, began to refurbish, refurnish, retrain the Syrian military. And then the biggest event was that the Iranians took up the cause on behalf of Hafez al-Assad. Iran and Syria have had a relationship that goes back to the 1970s. Not only that, the Iranians brought in their chief proxy, Hezbollah, the party of God. Who, who are Hezbollah? Do you remember the Marine Corps barracks bombing in 1983? Do you remember the attacks on the US Embassy in 1983? Do you remember the, Ameri the American hostages, Jacobson, Father Jenko, uh, Anderson, Terry Anderson, the journalist? That's all, that was all the work of Hezbollah. I'm trying to suggest they are not nice people. They were brought in, and now the tide has begun to turn, and the Assad, Assad and the regime are starting to gain some solid footing. So we've gone from a civil war to a proxy war. And to make it even more complicated, some new groups have come in who are Sunni-sponsored terrorist groups with names like Jabhat al-Nusra, violent, vicious terrorist group, very effective, and perhaps the biggest newcomer the one that causes most uh, of the problems will be the Islamic State of Iraq. The Islamic State of Iraq used to be in Iraq, hence the name. And they were the ones in 2005 and 2006 that committed such widespread atrocities led by a guy named Zarqawi, so widespread that we had the, Su the Sunni uprising, the, the, the Sunni protesting against this guys, uh, these guys, that led to the surge and more uh, active cooperation. So here's how confusing it is, all right? You have the rebels, as we think of them in a classic term. The rebels are fighting Assad. The rebels are also fighting the terrorist groups, all right? The terrorist groups are trying to get in, muscle in, and left, to their, uh, left unchecked, they will succeed. The United States hates al-Qaeda, right? Al-Qaeda hates the Assad regime. We're about to bomb the Assad regime, which will please the Al-Qaeda guys. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's unavoidable, but welcome, again, welcome to the, to the, to the Middle East. What, uh, what this map illustrates, uh, I think it's blue, or let's call it turquoise, but you get the point. It's not yellow. <laughs> yellow is Sunni. Look at the way that map unfolds. From the west, from, your, uh, from the far right, you have western Afghanistan. That is virtually an Iranian province today. Iran supplies electricity. The Uranian real is the, is the dominant currency. 
And, and after, by the way, this is an aside, but after the US forces move, I do worry about what happens to the stability of Afghanistan with this, this uh, uh, aggressive Iranian outlook. We go through Iran, we go through Iraq. Iraq, uh, yesterday, two days ago, said it would refuse any overflights by, by the US military to supply, to, to conduct any kind of military operations in Syria. Thank you very much. And then you have Syria. Syria is the crown jewel in these efforts of Iran to acquire influence and control. They will control it from the Mediterranean all the way across through parts of Pakistan and into Afghanistan. The other thing that's uh, starting to occur, and it will be seen here a little more, Syria is starting to fracture, starting to break up into various pieces. The boundaries of Syria were, 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 were derived by colonial powers in 1916, uh, the agreement between the French and the British, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, and they've endured ever since. But this would be a big development. You would have a country disintegrate. The yellow would be the Alawites, roughly favorable to the Assad regime. The blue would be the, uh, the rebels, so-called rebels, you can make out there's a circle, and above it is the name Raqqa. That's the largest hydroelectric project in Syria. It sits astride the Euphrates River. Who, who controls that will control a significant amount of the water resources. That's bad news for the people in Iraq, for example, uh, because the Euphrates is such a, a, a main waterway and a lifeline for them. And then a group we haven't talked about in that corner, those are the Kurds. And the Kurds are arrested. The Kurds are very op opportunistic. They see a chance to uh, gain more autonomy and influence. And any time you make a statement like that, the guys north, called Turkey, the Turkish uh, Turks, get very nervous about that. And so you've got several little dramas, mini dramas, uh, going on under underway. It is my feeling at the present time. Well, let's. We're, we're skipping probably the most significant event. And that was on August 21st, when reports surfaced of weapons of mass destruction being used on the outskirts of Damascus. We're not sure who, who the perpetrators were, although John Kerry, Secretary of State John Kerry, made it pretty clear that he, he, he blamed the administration. He said this is a, uh, uh, he called it a moral uh, obscenity. And he said, the facts now are undeniable. Uh, and as you know, a year ago in August, President Obama established a red line that the use of chemical weapons would result in military action and military reprisals. So as we speak, four destroyers are off the coast of, of Syria uh, in the Mediterranean. There may even be a nuclear arm, a submarine there, missile armed. Uh, there are two large carriers <clears throat> in the Persian Gulf, one steaming up the Red Sea. The, the uh, Stennis and the, uh, the Nimitz and the uh, Truman, I believe, and then a large, what they call a large deck amphibious uh, uh, warship. So there's a lot of firepower underway. I saw a report that was apparently leaked to NBC. I can't vouch for the accuracy, but it said an attack could occur as early as Thursday. Probably what, what informed sources are saying is that it will be uh, Tomahawk cruise missiles uh, that will be aimed at symbols and important facilities of the regime. It's unlikely that they would attempt to, uh, uh, to, to attack the, the chemical weapons themselves. Those are all buried in bunkers, and these weapons are inappropriate, wouldn't do the job. So by the weekend, we may have some, some direct military action. And I have to tell you, very frankly, having looked at this region for 40 years, I'm very uneasy. The law of unintended consequences. One thing I've learned in the Middle East is that you can't be half pregnant. Once you're there, you're there. And I don't care how you describe it, how you label it, we will become a target. And the potential for asymmetrical warfare is quite high. For example, there's an unconfirmed report, unconfirmed, all right, that the Iranians have advised the Hezbollah in Lebanon to start taking Americans and holding them for hostage. That's, that's unconfirmed. But it does give you an example. Uh, Iran doesn't need a lot of F-16s, which they don't have anyway, that fly anyway. 
And so you may see some reprisals. I hope it doesn't come to that. But the president is in a very difficult position. If you think, you think you've had to make some tough choices. The White House is now undergoing some of the toughest deliberations that a president can face. And we have, the problem is that we, we have sufficient military power, but that, that only gets us part of the way. And I cannot, for the life of me, fathom what ba uh, Bashir al-Assad was thinking. He's a ruthless man beyond words. We don't see these people, thank God. He's also very clever. Some, he has something in mind, or his, his clients, or his, his, pro, his uh, holders, his minders, the Iranians, have something. And the Russians will be ever helpful. You can count on that. Uh, was it two days ago the Russian foreign minister said there's no proof that, that the regime used chemical weapons? Uh, the Russians are getting a lot of mileage out of simply poking their finger in Washington's eye. So it won't, it won't be pretty. So there you have it. There's the happy-go-lucky Middle East all unfolding. Now let me return. I began the conversation by talking about the clash of a civilization. I'm going to end it that way. I'm going to show you a slide. This, uh, this takes place on the Corniche in Alexandria, Egypt. Lovely, lovely city. The Pearl of the, of the Mediterranean, it's called. These are breaker kind of stones where young Egyptians go out in the evening and socialize, uh, get out of the house. Uh, it's very hard to find space in today's Egypt. Uh, young women go out and, and mingle with young men that are not members of their family. Sometimes they do such daring things as hold hands. Uh, and the, thanks to an Egyptian blogger that I've been reading for several years, I, I can tell you what it means. The stone or the, uh, on the right in the blue, written by a Salafist, uh, ultra-conservative, puritanical uh, 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 Muslim, says, to another man, do you accept, do you allow your sister to come out and do these kinds of things? You know, mingle with men that are not members of your own family. Do you allow that? Uh, uh, chastising him for that. On, on the uh, left, in black, written by a woman, says, yes, I accept that because I am free. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the clash of a civilization. And thank you all very much. Now what we're going to do, we'll come to the fun part. If you have any questions or comments, we'll have folks with microphones. Um, and we'll try my best. I'll try my best to answer them if you have any, if I haven't scared you off. Yes, sir. What is the, what is the likelihood? What is the, the likelihood, instead of the United States being the number one big brother, to uh, enroll and enlist uh, our uh, France, uh, some of the uh, European countries, to take the more dominant role if there is an invasion? Good question. I think you could all hear that, correct? Uh, could somebody else take the load off? Well, we've tried that. The example was Libya. It didn't go well. I mean, uh, no one has the air power, for instance, that the United States has. Um, so the Obama administration a phrase has been coined about the Obama administration called leading from behind, but really I think what it means is working more in partnership with other countries. And, you know, it's fashionable, has been fashionable to criticize the French, but my goodness, the French were there on the front lines during Libya, and they did the best they could. Um, I think now it is imperative. It is imperative because the president put his personal credibility on the line. You use, you use chemical weapons, I'm going to retaliate. He's got to do something. He's in a tough position. And in effect, if you wanted to be cynical, you could say Bashar al-Assad called his bluff. That's the horrible reality of the Middle East. Uh, Great Britain, the UK, will be very, very helpful. Uh, in their own way, the Saudis will be very helpful. You know, the Saudis don't always go out and buy things. They can rent them, though. They have that kind of money. And they can be effective at, you know, they can be effective at doing that. Uh, but it's a tall order to stay abreast of the Iranians because they have so many ways. Uh, I mean, one of their proxies has something like 40,000 missiles not far from the Israeli border. I'm not suggesting they would use it, but it's there and the Israelis know it's there. So 
chances of that, the U.S. will be in the lead. It'll be a very complicated, I, I, I mean, I, it will be a very co complicated, not impossible, but difficult legal justification, won't it? You, they won't, the United Nations Security Council will not approve it. The closest precedent was, was Kosovo in the 90s when they se secured um, a NATO cover, but, but not a legal, uh, you know, justification or authorization for the use of force, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So, stay tuned. We'll see. Oh, yes, I see a hand. Sorry, uh, it, sometimes it's hard for me to see. Uh, um, Iraqis seeking asylum and now Syrians. Um, and if, if the stability in Jordan were to be compromised, how would that affect the region? And, um, and obviously, how would that affect American? Uh, that's, a, that's a very important question. Jordan has been traditionally the quiet little house in the neighborhood under King Abdullah. Uh, Jordan is, is uh, at ground zero in terms of the spillover effect from the Syrian uh, conflict. They're getting, some, in some places, 2,000 refugees a day. It's a very dreadful situation. The U.S. has recognized that. I think it's a smart decision. It's a kind of a containment policy. The president and his senior staff have said, we're not going to go, we're not going to put boots on the ground in Syria, but we are going to beef up these neighboring countries, Turkey and Jordan. Jordan has, uh, has Patriot missile batteries, and I believe it has F-16 aircraft. They may, f they may be used in any subsequent uh, military operation uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Syria. But Jordan, uh, Jordan is weak to begin with. It has a kind of a tenuous political situation. It has its own Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the king falls in and out of favor. Uh, sometimes he shows leadership and, and other times he doesn't. He has arrested Bedouin population. So you have all the ingredients for a country that doesn't need a big push that might come from the turmoil of Syria. And I, I, I think it's a very, very, it's one of the most important countries today in that whole complex, and especially when we talk about Syria. Yes. A few years ago, there was a, I believe it was called the Green Revolution in Iran. Yes. And uh, we were criticized, the United States, for not supporting that uh, revolt. Had that succeeded, would there be a different situation regarding the export of terrorism and the nuclear situation in Iran now? The Green Revolution unfolded. It was a protest movement. It brought hundreds of thousands, and maybe you recall some of the pictures of young Iranians being brutally shot dead in the streets of Tehran. It was just an awful situation. Uh, but as Tom Friedman said once, that bang, bang beats tweet, tweet. In other words, all of the social media, you know, these flash mobs in effect, the regime was unbelievably brutal. And they were prepared to pay any price to put that down. And, and, and they succeeded. And they have crushed the green movement, effectively. Had they succeeded, let's say they had succeeded, um, you, you know, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to say, Larry, I, I'm not dodging the question, but if we look at the two guys, for example, that are under house arrest, both of them supported the nuclear program. Both of them were involved when they were in government with some of the terrorist activities. So it's hard to say because it's, it seems to be part of the Iranian DNA. Again, they're, they're, it would take a dramatic revolution, the likes of which the Iranians experienced in 79, to bring that kind of change. And, and that's not in the cards right now. It, it, they, you know, there's a Persian, well, if it isn't a Persian proverb, it should be. Uh, it, it goes like this. It said, it's better to, have, better to have an army of lambs led by a lion than an army of lions led by a lamb. And that was the problem with the Green Movement. They had, did not have charismatic, decisive, tough, risk-taking leadership. And they were crushed. Sad to say, and you know, when we were, we were in Tehran, we were uh, throughout Iran. Uh, after that, in 2009, the people were lovely and, and gracious and all of that. Um, 
the bitterness was there and it was not far under the surface, but the muscle to do something about it was lacking. In fact, we were in a central bank once, and, and these are sharp people, and occasionally they would send some of their up and coming junior officers down to act as tour guides so they could practice their English. Their English was already very good. And I remember walking with one of them, very, you know, handsome, well dressed guy. And apropos of nothing, out of the blue, he leans over and whispers to me and another woman whom he's never met, either one of us, he says, and he whispers, he said, we have the most stupid president in the world. <laughs> and and that, that was the dominant mood of, of the, green, the green movement, but they couldn't take it beyond that, much as the political parties. You know, it breaks my heart to see the young Egyptians have their hearts broken because I saw the Iranians at the same time, the same age, have the same uh, 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 result. It, it, their voices were, they, they contributed to the revolution, but then they could confront, but they could not construct. That was the problem. And that's the problem with social media. It only takes you to a certain point. I'm going to get a tough one now. How, how do you see the wild card of Israel in well, all of this? Well, that's, that is a very important question, and I've skirted it, and, and, and deliberately so, I guess. <laughs> no, Israel is quite apprehensive right now. Israel, as I said, sees itself in a state of strategic distress. Uh, that may be one of the reasons, by the way, that there have been three rounds of negotiations between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Perhaps they realized that it would be good if they could alleviate, remove some of the baggage uh, so that they could have the decks clear for dealing with what happens in Syria. Uh, today in, in Israel, they're terribly concerned about the aftermath of the missile strikes. Uh, there was a senior uh, Israeli delegation in Washington yesterday uh, that was discussing uh, just that. The, uh, I don't think Israel faces any great existential crisis in terms of military, uh, but they're very worried. Uh, they're very worried about Iranian proxies, Hamas, which is just a few miles, like from here to Lolo, I guess. It's very, very close, you know, for the borders, uh, responding with rockets, as they have done. There were a couple of rockets fired not too long ago. They're worried very much about Hezbollah, which still has an arsenal of 40 to 60,000 missiles that could rain down uh, on, on, on Israel. So uh, they don't sleep well. They, they don't sleep well. And, and as you know, Israelis worry for a living. And if you lived, if you lived in that neighborhood, you would, you would worry too. Uh, but, but Israel, you know, this is a, a terrible, turbulent region. Israel's intelligence and military assets are very important now to this and, and previous administrations because they have the wherewithal uh, to act. As, as someone once said as a joke, the, Israeli, the Israelis can resist everything but temptation. And they've been very, very concerned about Iran's nuclear program. So uh, the government of Netanyahu is, is very, very uneasy, very, very uneasy. And they'll be even more uneasy if Washington tells them to stand down. Don't put yourself into the conflict. Because once it has the coloration of Israel, the Arabs will unify around that, and it will become this classic Arab-Israeli conflict. And Israelis, I hope, know that. I think they've learned the lesson from uh, 1991 during Desert Storm when they were told to stood down, stand down and they did. So you are correct to point out Israel. That's, a, that's an important. To return to if you would return to Syria for just a minute. Yeah. Um, I have a fairly simple mind, I guess. but I don't I, think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand how what we're going to target if we take, go, go in there without having collateral damage that's going to equal all those people that were killed in the, the gas. I mean, I, what, what do you drop a bomb on? Yeah, I mean, that's a very important question, and that's the one that the White House is, is trying to resolve, if they can. They can't do nothing. They have to do something. They have to have some sort of military action. When I say they have to, because the president's authority and credibility is on the line, because he said the United States would react. So if they do nothing, there are consequences. You don't think the Egyptian generals are watching this to see what happens in Syria? You know the Iranians are watching this. 
They believe that, as, as Osama bin Laden once said, the Americans are weak, effeminate, uh, hit them once and they'll run. And that's the, that's the, the, that's the dilemma that faces the, the president. Now, what will they hit? My suspicion, my suspicion is that they will hit things like the Secret Service headquarters, like the 4th Division, which is commanded by one of, the Assad, one of Assad's brothers, the Republican Guard, uh, symbols of the regime. And, and a cruise missile will get your attention. But what, will it be uh, crippling? Will it be a decapitation? Will it be shock and awe? No. No, it will not. And it should not be, I think, in my view. Unless, and this is the law of unexpected consequences, these engagements seldom go the way you would like them to go. All right? We've been through this. What is the latest opinion? 65% of Americans are opposed to this. That's not a good number if you're a president you're trying to convince your fellow citizens that this is important. And that's why I think John Kerry is, is making this case of atrocities and crimes against humanity to give people something they can hold, hold on to. Uh, that's the best I can answer it. it. They will not go after, as I said, they would not go after chemical facilities because A, they can't find them, and B, they can't destroy them. And what do you want? Uh, do you want a lot of sarin gas floating around? Uh, they're not, it, it's not that kind of a deal, but you just, because they're, hit, they're uh, sheltered in bunkers, I don't think you can take them out. So if it's a light antiseptic kind of strike, uh, it will serve some symbolic purpose. Uh, the, As the Assad government is banking on the fact that they can ride it out and live to fight another day. Now, if a if U.S. service personnel is killed, if a plane is shot down, the, the uh, Syrians have some form of a, a reasonably well-developed air defense system. It's possible. And then you have a whole new, right? Does anybody remember the Gulf of Tonkin? Yeah. I'm not saying that this is going to unfold that way, but I, I am saying psychology happens you know, in, in, in war. The fog of war, I guess it's called. Mark. How important is it to the average man or woman on the street in Iran that the country develop a nuclear weaponry? And the question really has to do with, is it plausible for the new president there to negotiate away that capability? How important is it for the nuclear, uh, I think you said weapons? The nuclear program is generally supported by a favorable majority in public opinion polls, and they're reasonably good. Uh, but the question is never asked, are you willing to pay for them? Because the average Iranian is not willing to pay for them, because the average Iranian is suffering big time. It's a matter of prestige, not the weapons program. Because the weapons program equals sanctions, and they're hurting from the sanctions. Okay, so, so there the support lacks, uh, drops off. Um, there are signals coming from the supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, who has a virulent hatred of the United States, has for decades. Nevertheless, there are, I mean, the man is, is, is homicidal, but he's not suicidal. There are signals coming out that he would at least be prepared to talk, or would authorize talks. And, and I think that's a good thing. I think we, we need to get back to the table with the Iranians and see just how far we can go. I'm troubled by this business with the sanctions and just how far we, we can actually go in, in alleviating those sanctions. But, you know, you have to take what you've got. Uh, the signals seem to be genuine, uh, whether or not at the end of the day. We, ha we haven't had a round of discussion since early, early this year. The three rounds last year were deplorable. But those guys were hard, hard, rigid, uncompromising idiots, the negotiators. They've just been fired in the last couple of days. Zarif is a sharp guy. Zarif has negotiated. Zarif has, in fact, it was, it was Javed Zarif was the guy in 2001 or 2002 in the run-up to the Karzai government in Afghanistan that worked with U.S. negotiators. And actually, the Iranians furnished us with some intelligence because they didn't like some of the bad guys like the Taliban. So he's capable of playing that game. All I'm going to say right now, let's, let's just take it for what it's worth and, and, and take them at their word. And I would, if I were in Washington, I'd go right back to the Iranians and say, great, you want to talk? We want to talk. How's Wednesday? <laughs> and then I'd wait and see what they would say. That's, that, you know, I'd, I'd, instead of being so defensive and say, well, if you, you know, uh, go back and see. The problem is you're, you're, you have a Secretary of State who's kind of preoccupied right now. 
and the Secretary of Defense is even more preoccupied. One clue, by the way, that military action is maybe imminent is that yesterday there was a secret meeting, actually it wasn't secret because I know about it now, <laughs> <laughs> that took place in Amman, Jordan with the Ministers of Defense, Secretary of Defense and Ministers of Defense from nine countries. Uh, I find that a, a very clear signal that they're planning actual operations together. So, you know, we'll see. So when I come back from one of my trips, we'll see, we'll have this conversation again, see what it looks like. So, let's see. Oh, I see something, yes. I have the tendency to, uh, when I want to follow a conflict, I tend to follow the money. And in the case <laughs> of Syria, I mean, I, it was my understanding that the catalyst for the uh, conflict in Syria was an agrarian revolt. And, and I'm having a little difficulty uh, seeing that, that basically there were other factions that hijacked that kind there of were, revolt. Yeah. revolt. Yeah. And so I'm wondering uh, what, uh, what is really of strategic importance uh, in, in the essence of trying to follow the money and why is Syria uh, such a volatile place right now. Well, you're absolutely right, and it's a point that's often overlooked, is that uh, Syria and Iraq are experiencing severe drought, and food uh, production has plummeted maybe by 40 percent. A lot of that has to do with water and rainfall and access to the Euphrates and Tigris and the water and the river sources. And I think there was a lot of pent-up animosity toward the regime anyway. Uh, but, y y you know, no good revolution, no good revolt, no good uh, demonstration uh, goes uh, unwanted, unneeded in, in, in countries like that. And the original, uh, the original protesters from the various uh, uh, mostly secular, not exclusively, but mostly secular non-Islamist uh, uh, parties behaved the same way as they did in Tunisia and Egypt. They wanted to get rid of the evil, unjust ruler. And then hardcore elements came in and hijacked it. That's the correct word. They hijacked the, the, the movement. Um, and moreover, <clears throat> let's just call them generically the rebels. They couldn't get their act together. They couldn't agree. There was no unanimity. Part of the reason was because of the patrons, the outside patrons had their own favorites that they were pushing. You would think that the Sunnis would be of one mind and one voice. Not so. The, Sun uh, the Saudis were pushing one candidate for the national coalition. The Qataris were pushing another candidate. Well, when you have that, you know, the Iranians don't have that kind of problem when they're pushing their guys. It's one voice. Plus, it is said, and I've not, se I've not seen this refuted, that Iran has put upwards of $10 billion into this. As I said, this is a big deal for the Iran, for, for the government of Iran. To put it in another perspective, were the government of Iran to fail, in other words, uh, their client Assad, their favorite Assad were to be toppled, this would have an immense impact on internal Iranian politics. Why? Because the guys leading the charge in, uh, on behalf of Iran are the Revolutionary Guard. And they would, uh, they would take a big blow if they were uh, to lose. And they might even, you know, that might unloose, un un unleash enough domestic forces. But uh, the guys that are the most opportunistic now are coming from the violent jihadist side, as I suggested. And you notice another clue. Secretary of State Kerry today said, uh, we want to deal with these weapons of mass destruction. I think he said that roughly that way. We do not, however, want to engage in reg reg regime, regime change. That's a clue. It's a very powerful signal. You know what it means? This guy Assad is terrible, but he's not Al-Qaeda. And I think what you're seeing is Washington is extremely concerned about the rise of radical terrorism coming out of this, possibly in Egypt, maybe likely in Egypt. Certainly if the wrong guys win, we're going to get a repeat of what we saw in Iraq. And that just can't, nothing, none of that can be good. Um, that's the best I can answer that. So, want to do one more? Okay. Do we have one more? Yes.
Mark, if you're the, in the unenviable position of advising the president today with regard to Syria, what would you say from a policy point of view and a political point of view? Well, right now, that's not a valid question because he has no choice but to react. I would say that if you're going to deal with Syria, <clears throat> let's put it to you, I'll put it to you this way. Let's go back to 2011, to the initial discussion. We talked about March 2011. Things were breaking out. There was a group of so-called rebels. Uh, Assad initially was rocked, set back on his heels. The rebels seemed to be gaining ground. That was the time I would have said, let's think about supporting these guys and supplying them with some decent weapons. You know, the president said, uh, as, a, as a kind of a placeholder to the, to the suspe suspected use of chemical weapons back, back uh, a month or a few weeks ago, that he would, he would provide lethal aid. He was under a lot of criticism for not doing that. That was June, not a drop has arrived. That period in the, in the spring of 2011 would have been the moment to have inter, in, in, intervened. I mean, we have a lot of guys from the CIA that do these kind of things. They did them in Afghanistan. That would have been one possibility. President, you know, would have had, that would have been, you know, there would have been some consequences. See, the thing about the Middle East is that you only pay retail. There are no wholesale prices, right? Sounds like a joke, but I'm very serious. You pay the price now, or you pay the price tomorrow, it always goes up. It always goes up. And given our own domestic constraints that any president has, it's very hard to, uh, to, to, to do those sort of things. My, probably my policy, sense, uh, policy advice would have been, as the, as the lady asked about Jordan, look at the neighborhood, do whatever it takes to beef these guys up. We've got a, uh, a, a leader, a prime minister in Turkey that's saying some pretty stupid things. Nevertheless, you've got to work with him, <clears throat> the Israelis, and I think that, that, that relationship is rock, sil rock solid. Um, to a certain extent, the Arab League, the Saudis, and, and, the, and, and the Gulf states. Gulf states are terrified right now. Their grave concern is that the U.S. is going to abandon them. And so they are looking to see how the U.S. is going to react to this. And this uh, notion, the president does not like this word but I think, nevertheless, it is an apt word for policy. It's called containment. He said, I don't have a policy of containment with, with, with Iran. And if they develop a bomb, I'm just going to blow them out of the water. Well, I think it worked reasonably well with the Soviets for many decades. That is the policy of containment. I would like to see more of that, more support for the regional players. Um, and that's about as far as I think I could go right now. You know, because now we don't know who... As, as Secretary of Defense uh, said, uh, or the ch Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, said the other day, we don't know who the good guys are. We don't know who to support, frankly. It's a pretty st candid admission. So, okay, I think I think we've exhausted the limits of my knowledge. <laughs> Thank you very much.